Hi, welcome to part one of This Week in Tudor History, with me, Claire Ridgway, author of several Tudor history books. Now today, I'm going to be introducing you to an alchemist who worked not only for Dr John Dee, but also for two prominent prisoners in the Tower of London, the Earl of Northumberland, who was known as the Wizard Earl, and also Sir Walter Raleigh. I'll also be telling you about a doctor who attended on the princes in the tower and a duke with Plantagenet blood whose rigged trial showed Henry VIII just how he could get rid of people he feared or didn't like. I'm going to start off by telling you about alchemist Roger Cook, who was born on the 1st of February 1552 in the reign of King Edward VI. Cook's beginnings are obscure, but in 1567, when he was 14 years of age, he joined the household of Dr John Dee and became his assistant. Cook helped Dee with his experiments in alchemy and may also have practised scrying, that is to say, divining. In his diary entry for the 28th of December 1579, Dee recorded... I revealed to Roger Cook the great secret of the elixir of the salt, an alchemical secret which is thought to be alchemical projection with salts of metals. Dee obviously trusted Cook and they had a good relationship. However, in 1581, the relationship came to rather an abrupt end. In his diary entry for the 5th of September, Dee records what happened. September the 5th. Roger Cook, who had been with me from his 14 years of age till 28, of a melancholic nature, picking and devising occasions of just cause to depart on the sudden about four of the clock in the afternoon, requested of me license to depart, whereupon rose what words between us, and he, imagining with himself that he had the 12th of July deserved my great displeasure, and finding himself barred from view of my philosophical dealing with Mr. Henrik, thought that he was utterly recessed from intended goodness toward him. Notwithstanding Roger Cook, his unseemly dealing, I promised him if he used himself towards me now in his absence, £100 as soon as of my own clean ability I might spare so much. And moreover, if he used himself well in life towards God and the world, I promised him some pretty alchemical experiments whereupon he might honestly live. However, two days later, D recorded September the 7th, Roger Cook went for altogether from me. And on the 29th of September, Dee replaced him with Robert Gardner of Shrewsbury. We don't know what Cook did next, but if we fast forward to 1600 when Cook was 48, he's mentioned again in Dee's diary. Dee records September 30th, after the departing of Mr. Francis Nichols, his daughter, Mistress Mary, his brother, Mr. William, Mr. Wortley, at my return from Deansgate to the end whereof I brought them on foot, Mr. Roger Cook offered and promised his faithful and diligent care and help to the best of his skill and power in the processes chemical, and that he will rather do so than to be with any in England, which his promise the Lord bless and confirm. He told me that Mr. Anthony considered him very liberally and friendly, but he told him that he had promised me. Then he liked in him the fidelity of regarding such his promise. The Mr. Anthony that is mentioned here must be the physician and alchemist who went on to sell his secret remedy of drinkable gold. I did a video on him, so I'll give you a link to that in the description. It seems that Cook was going to work for Anthony or had been working for him, but excused himself as promised to Dee. In a later diary entry, Dee recorded that Cook began to distill on the 1st of November. Just three months later, on the 2nd of February 1601, Dee recorded that his son Arthur had found Cook going through a box of Arthur's papers. Suspecting Cook of plotting against his father, Arthur took Cook before Dee. Fortunately, Dee was able to record in his diary, all was mistaken and we reconciled godly. 
Dee goes on to write that the two were reconciled and that he explained it all to his wife and sons. There's an interesting entry in Dee's diary just over three weeks later on the 25th of February when Dee records our cook pactum sacrum ora octave mane, meaning sacred pact eight o'clock in the morning with no other details. And then the next entry is March the 2nd. Mr. Roger Cook went toward London. Perhaps the pact was regarding Cook leaving Dee's service but promising to keep his work secret. We don't know. Historian Lauren Castle notes that a Roger Cook was employed by Henry Percy, 9th Earl of Northumberland, and Sir Walter Raleigh to build and run a still house at the Tower of London between 1606 and around 1609. Northumberland was known as the Wizard Earl due to his experiments in alchemy and science, and he and Raleigh were prisoners in the Tower at the time. Raleigh was able to persuade the lieutenant of the Tower to let them convert a hen house into a still house. Charles Webster, author of Health, Medicine and Mortality in the 16th century, writes that Raleigh then studied the chemistry of metals and prepared his celebrated cordials and other medicines. Cook is also linked to Cornelis Treble, who was working in Prague from 1610 at the invitation of Emperor Rudolf II, who was interested in alchemy. A man named Cook assisted Treble with his experiments before returning to England in 1612. It's not known what happened to Cook after his return or when he died. He just disappears from the records. An interesting man. I'm going to give you a link in the description to read Dr John Dee's private diary online. It makes for very interesting reading. Moving on to the 2nd of February. On the 2nd of February, 1508, in the reign of King Henry VII, physician and provost of King's College, Cambridge, John Argentine, died at King's College. He was about 65 years of age at his death. He was laid to rest in the Chantry Chapel at the college. Cambridgeshire man Argentine was educated at Eton and King's College, Cambridge, studying theology before spending three years studying medicine in Italy. On his return to England, he began practising medicine at the Royal Court. According to Domenico Mancini, Argentine attended King Edward V and his brother Richard of Shrewsbury, Duke of York, commonly known as the Princes in the Tower and he was said to be the last person to attend them before their disappearance. In King Henry VII's reign, he was physician to the king's eldest son, Arthur Tudor, Prince of Wales, who sadly died in 1502. Argentine was appointed as provost of King's College in 1501. In his will, he left 100 marks to kings, as well as a silver basin and ewer. Argentine wrote two works, a poem in Latin and a medical commonplace book. Moving on to the 3rd of February. On the 3rd of February, 1478, in the reign of King Edward IV, Edward Stafford, 3rd Duke of Buckingham, was born at Brecon Castle. His father, the 2nd Duke of Buckingham, was executed as a traitor in King Richard III's reign, and Edward actually came to the same end in 1521 in King Henry VIII's reign. Let me tell you a bit more about this Duke of Buckingham. Edward Stafford was the eldest son of Henry Stafford, 2nd Duke of Buckingham, and his wife, Catherine Woodville, Catherine being the sister of Elizabeth Woodville, Elizabeth Woodville, of course, being King Edward IV's Queen Consort. Stafford's father was executed in November 1483 after rebelling against King Richard III, and young Edward went into hiding. King Henry VII came to the throne in 1485 following his victory over Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth Field, and Edward became a Knight of the Bath in the celebrations for the new king's coronation in October 1485. The following month, his father's attainder was posthumously reversed, allowing Edward to become Duke of Buckingham. 
His mother married King Henry VII's uncle, Jasper Tudor, but seven-year-old Edward's wardship was granted to Lady Margaret Beaufort, who was King Henry VII's mother, and she was put in charge of his education. Henry VII had been keen on a potential marriage match between Buckingham and Anne of Brittany, but Edward ended up marrying Eleanor Percy, daughter of the late 4th Earl of Northumberland in 1490. The couple went on to have four children, Elizabeth, who married Thomas Howard, 3rd Duke of Norfolk, Catherine, who married Rafe Neville, 4th Earl of Westmoreland, Mary, who married George Neville, 5th Baron Burgoveny, and Henry Stafford, 1st Baron Stafford, who married Ursula Pole. Buckingham also had two illegitimate children, a son Henry and a daughter Margaret. Margaret married her father's ward, Thomas Fitzgerald. In 1495, when he was 17, Buckingham became a Knight of the Garter, and three years later, the King granted him livery of his estates. In 1497, the same year his first child, Elizabeth, was born, Buckingham served as a soldier in the King's forces against pretender Perkin Warbeck. And in 1501, he attended the marriage of Arthur Tudor, Prince of Wales, and Catherine of Aragon, and was the chief challenger at the celebratory jousts. In 1509, following the death of King Henry VII and the accession of 17-year-old King Henry VIII, Buckingham served as Lord High Constable and Lord High Steward at the new King's coronation, and in 1513, he commanded forces in the King's French campaign. In 1510, Buckingham heard rumours that his sister Anne, Lady Hastings, was committing adultery with Sir William Compton, a man close to Henry VIII. Compton swore on the sacrament that he had not had an affair with Anne, while Buckingham sent his sister away to a convent. In around 1517, Buckingham was supposed to be a challenger running against the king and his companions in a tournament, but Buckingham pulled out, not wanting to run against the king. And in 1520, at the Field of Cloth of Gold meeting between Francis I of France and Henry VIII, Buckingham did not tilt, taking the role of judge of the tournaments instead. Buckingham had Plantagenet blood. He descended from John of Gaunt and Thomas of Woodstock, both sons of King Edward III. And he and Cardinal Wolsey, the king's chief advisor, did not get on. Both of those facts made him vulnerable. And in April 1521, the Duke was arrested, accused of treason. His chancellor, chaplain, an ex-estate official and a Carthusian monk gave evidence against him, accusing Buckingham of listening to the monk's political prophecies since 1512. These prophecies had said that Buckingham would one day be king. It was said that Buckingham also believed that the king's lack of a living male heir was due to a curse on the Tudors, which dated back to the execution of potential claimant to the throne, Edward Plantagenet, Earl of Warwick, son of George, Duke of Clarence, in 1499. In his trial, which began on the 13th of May, 1521, Buckingham was accused of trying to bribe members of the King's Guard, trying to build a following and plotting to depose the King. In his book, The Tudors, A Very Short Introduction, historian John Guy writes that Buckingham's downfall was down to Henry VIII's fear of his wealth and his old Yorkist connections, and that he was put on trial on trumped-up charges, and that the evidence was just hearsay. Guy goes on to say, The Duke protested that his trial was rigged, for Henry interviewed and even coached the witnesses beforehand, forcing information out of Buckingham's chaplain and so breaking the seal of the confessional. Buckingham's complaints didn't help. On the 16th of May, he was found guilty of treason by a jury of his peers and sentenced to death. Buckingham was executed by beheading on Tower Hill on the 17th of May, 1521. He was buried at the church of the Austin Friars in London. In 1523, Buckingham was posthumously attainted by Parliament, preventing his children inheriting his title or lands. 
John Guy concludes that Buckingham's case taught Henry VIII that rather than bypassing the law as his father's bureaucrats had sometimes done, he could instead subvert it, getting everything he wanted apparently legally. Of course, others would suffer from trumped-up charges and rigged trials in Henry VIII's reign. This was just the beginning. In part two of This Week in Tudor History, I'll be talking about the wedding of a princess and an earl, a spy who worked for Spain during the time of the Spanish Armada but who escaped trouble, a Tudor lawyer, and the evening that Mary, Queen of Scots, was told that she was going to be executed the next day. Do watch out for that. And do look in the video description for the links that I've mentioned and also for the videos on the other Tudor events that happened on these dates. You can subscribe to this channel by clicking round about there, just where Madge is hiding. Just I'm not sure whether she's in view or not. You can hit the bell to be notified as these videos go live. You can give me a like or give Madge a like, perhaps. And you can leave a comment if you wish as well. I'll see you very soon. Thank you for joining me. Take care. Bye-bye.